to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast, where we slice through the noise to bring you the juiciest insights, strategies, and stories from the dynamic world of pickleball. Join us as we serve up engaging conversations with top players, coaches, and enthusiasts, giving you an ace perspective on all things pickleball. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just stepping onto the court, get ready for a volley of knowledge that'll elevate your game to alpha levels. Let the rallies begin. All right. Welcome again to your to the show. I'm your host, Tats. Uh, we're really excited to have Jaden uh broderick uh on the show Jaden, thank you thank you for coming on the show yes thanks for having me awesome um i i first discovered you uh, more recently um you're playing at the indian open how's that it was very good it's very well-run tournament by global sports and it ended with some pretty good results and met a lot of cool people awesome awesome um what were you doing uh, before pickleball? I was playing travel soccer and high school soccer mixed in with a little bit of tennis here and there for the high school team. Yeah. 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 No, that's cool. I mean, I, I mean, I see your, your strokes. I see you got a big two hander. I guess that's a direct carryover from tennis. Yes, it is. That was my favorite shot in tennis. And so it's carried over nicely. Yeah, yeah, because I do notice that you uh, you drive with the with the backhand a lot, which not everyone does. Yes, definitely not everybody does. And often you'll see if the forehand's not on. I'll run around to the backhand just to get on that drive. That's awesome. Um, no, that's that's very cool. I mean, I guess uh, being left-handed, I mean, b- being able to sort of rip a backhand is is probably a, a benefit for you. Yes, it definitely is because most people go to my forehand since it's the righty backhand. And so when they try to switch it up, then it works in my favor. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if, if you have a partner that loves the forehand, because a lot of people love the forehand, then if you have a righty partner, they, they, they can cover the middle with that, right? Yes, they can. And I can just sit back and all day and let them do the work. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so soccer and 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 um and tennis. So the tennis transfer is obvious. Um, has the soccer helped you in pickleball? So I was a goalie for most of it, and so it helped a lot with like hand eye coordination and hand speed. Yeah. And, and so then the footwork also comes in a lot when you're at the kitchen line and even back at the baseline. That's interesting. So when someone speeds up on you, is it almost that you're kind of used to getting fired at all the time? Almost, yes, because it's just like blocking a shot in soccer. So my hands are already right there, ready to go. It yeah, doesn't I help mean, with out balls, but it helps when they're in the strike zone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because you'll go for everything. Um, but um, I guess, I mean... I like soccer. I didn't play a lot of it. I did play goalie too. Um, although, you know, I imagine someone that did it a lot more than I did. Um, and goalies are just different type of people, aren't they? Yes, they are. So they describe mentality or the, the type of person that makes a good goalie. As a goalie, you got to think that as long as the team does their job, that you have to do yours and that you have to block all the shots that come your way and if you lose it's almost on you because at the end of the day you're the one that has the final say of whether the other team scores or not and so same thing in pickleball especially in singles it's just you and your opponent and at the end of the day only you can make yourself win or lose yeah i mean are you prioritizing singles or are you more doubles I'm more doubles now. Singles is a little too tough on the body. And are you 17? You're 17 though, right? Yes, I'm 17, but I still have a lot of knee pain and some just lingering stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, some of the uh, uh, growth gr growth related to that. You're you're a fairly tall person, right? How how tall are you? Yeah, so I'm about six five or six six, yeah. and so the growth pain is definitely pretty bad. Yeah. So, I mean, when I see you, Ernie, it's almost like you just take a step, right? So. Yes, it is. It's just a light little jump across the kitchen. So, I mean, that probably helps you reaching into the kitchen and stuff. I guess the difficulty is if it it's low shots like the I noticed with your forehand dink, you kind of have more of a straight arm approach opposed to maybe if someone that was a little shorter, they would use a different technique. Is that sort of adapted? Yes, it has. As I'm trying to bend my knees more, the form will change or vary, but definitely that form of dink right now since i'm taller is what's best yeah yeah because you gotta you, you don't want to be like bending your back like you know being so tall all, all the time <laughs> yep okay that's cool i mean what what are other tips that you've learned from i mean playing style and also adaptability of being tall i would say definitely stay more aggressive and definitely use your drives and then shake and bakes too or have your partner drive the ball so you can crash the net. That definitely helps a lot. And then push the Ernie's. Use your length to really get get across the kitchen so you can put the ball away. And then just use your angles as well. Yeah. Taller people usually have some easier angles to hit. Got it. You just you just try to keep the points a little bit shorter if you can reasonably. Don't get into those long, low, you know, reaching dink battles all day long. For sure. Yeah. The longer, the longer the dinks, the more the knees hurt and the more you have to bend. Got it. That makes us, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, maybe that could apply to if you're getting a little bit older as well, right? Is that, Hey, how, what can we do to shorten the points or adapt? Um, so you're not putting yourself in your body in maximal stress all the time. Yes, it definitely can. Yeah, As you so, get older, it would make a lot more sense to keep the points shorter. Yeah. And what have you learned particularly, because I'm lefty too, uh, playing left, uh, sorry, a lefty playing the right side? I think it's definitely a weapon because usually the right-sided player with a righty-righty team is kind of the setter-upper. And so it gives teams a different look, especially if you're the lefty and aggressive then you can be the aggressive player from the right side yeah or if you have two aggressive players a righty and a lefty then you can kind of split the role 50 50 and it's always giving the team different looks got it so you could basically um, create offense from both sides maybe being a little bit careful on certain situations from the the right being a lefty yes yes you definitely have to set up the points and not try to force it but from that side you can definitely create a lot more as a lefty yeah so i mean what sort of things do you like doing from the the right side as a lefty in terms of creating is it you you mentioned the poaching the shake and bake with the forehands in the middle but um what what else comes to mind i like the two-handed backhand roll either okay. on the drops or the dinks because you can really set your partner up on the other side for an Ernie or try to get a pop up Got and it. then just kind of the inside out forehands. Okay. Inside out forehands to set your partner up for an Ernie, a two hander roll two, and these are all going to the forehand. Um, I, I guess, you know, with the two hander, I mean, you have a lot of reach with your long arms, but do you find that like you have to use your footwork more for that or just because of your reach, you, you have quite a big wingspan with the two-hander? I think off the bounce, I definitely have to use a lot more footwork just to get the feet right and set. Yeah. But from the net, I can use my reach well okay. and it kind of compensates for some lack of footwork. Got it. So basically um, using your length, using uh, dinks or rolls, uh, cross court, um, you know, maybe towards the side or maybe the middle of the court, just set up a, a righty, uh, uh, you know, on the left side, Ernie. Yes.
Yeah, and I noticed something unique, and that's why draw drew my attention to you is you were, when you were playing with Ryler, you guys are playing left left, right? Because Ryler's left handed. I mean, have yes, you done so that a lot before? I've done it one or two other times. I did mixed doubles with Lee Whitwell, and since it was mixed, she played the left side for most of it. And then I did it also in a small tournament with Jonathan Medina Alvarez. And that went pretty well. I just think it's no different than a righty righty. It's just the same thing, but opposite pretty much, or like a mirror image. It's just a little tougher since usually the lefties don't have much experience on the left side. And so it took a little bit of getting used to. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that it, it seemed like you've done it before, but I mean, you don't see a lot. I know I interviewed uh, Pesa and some other people. They said, like, yeah, we want to try it. And it, you know, I saw you and Ryler do it. It was almost like you were fighting uh, each other for the diagonal. Like, you know, like you, you wanted the, you know, the, the forehands cross court, right? Like into that back yes. corner. And then they were trying to bring it to the other diagonal. And it was almost like you're fighting over, you know, who, who got more time in that diagonal. Yes, we definitely were. And we never, we didn't stack too much. And so it was always, you'd get lucky to be returning on the right side. Or if you get more time on the right side, since that's what we we're used to. Got it. So if, if one person was a little bit more adaptable or a little bit more comfortable with that forehand cross score drink dink as a lefty, then maybe they, you know, did, did Ryler spend a bit more time over there? Or like, well, how did, how do you guys stack? I spent a little bit more time on the left side. Okay. Just my reach. It's a little easier to take forehands out of the air. Yeah. And so we didn't really stack too much, but when we did, we would stack with Ryler on the left side or the right side. Okay. And we only did that on serves. We okay. never switched on returns. Got it. Got it. Um, would you ever, would you do that in the future again with the different uh, uh, lefty partners? I think so. Yeah. I definitely think if I train a little bit more on the left side or have a partner that's also very comfortable on that side, then I think it could work pretty well. Yeah, I noticed another team that had that sort of stack with the forehands on the outside, which was interesting. It seemed they were very successful. They both had two handers in the middle, uh, and they seemed very successful. I think it was on the women's side. I thought, well, that was neat. Yeah, that's very unique to see. The women's side especially, they have some really good two-handers, and so that could be helpful with the two-handers in the middle. And then they have good topspin forehand dinks as well. Yeah, because so, I feel like yeah. that ever since uh, Ben John said that, you know, the lefty-righty combo is great, there's just more and more teams or more more lefties are being cornered to pick up pick, pickleball or, and stuff. And and I'm seeing more of that combo. So I'm wondering at some point, will people just get used to that look and then require people to like, you know, move, shake it up with lefty-lefty or forehands on the outside or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, I think so too. I think there's a lot that can evolve from it and yeah. only time will tell once we finally get a lefty lefty team on the tour. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you're young, you're going to school. How do you fit pickleball in? So I usually try to play every day if I can. A lot of the people around where I live in Greenville, South Carolina work and nobody's really full time in on pickleball. And so it, allows me to go to school and then go to the gym or do high school's practice. And then by the time that they get off work, I'm usually able to play. And so I usually try to play mid afternoon if I get lucky or pretty late at night and just play as long as I can. Yeah. And is it just games drilling? Is there a purpose? Um, how's your training look like? It's all drilling pretty much. I maybe play games once or twice a month. Okay. Just because we don't have necessarily a solid group of four yeah. that can always play or always has the same schedule. Yeah. And so I usually bounce around and just drill doubles for the most part and then singles maybe once or twice every two weeks. Yeah. 
And it's usually the same routine, just kind of do dinks, some dinking games, and then take some drops and resets, and then work on hands, then kind of break off into some skinny singles and maybe a game or two of singles. Yeah, it's just it, the repetition uh, over and over and over on getting those like so sort of really solid. Yes, yes, I definitely think repetition is big. Yeah, and I know you you've um you know you progressed your game and you know you've taken your game from sort of um you know call it the amateur to the pro level. I mean, what did you notice when you started to to get access to and start to train with um more the the top players? I noticed that they were a lot more consistent and the ball that they hit is a lot heavier, more spin. And so you really have to move better and get lower to get your shots back over with a decent amount of spin. And just that there's a lot more to it in the pros than there is in the amateurs in terms of building the point and point structures. Okay. So more patience, more consistency, um, more pressure, therefore requiring better footwork or core positioning. Yes, yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you said there's not a lot of people in your area. Um, so uh, do you have a, a lot of people that you drill with? Is there a few people? Like what is your sort of, call it your uh, training camp look like? I would say I maybe have three to four guys that I would drill with and then playing is usually the same guys if I'm able to and I pretty much ask those few people and then if they can't then I'll go out and drill with my dad or just go out and kind of play with some friends from school still get in some reps when I can and then to get some higher level games i travel three hours away to charleston south carolina for like a weekend or i'll go up to charlotte north carolina which is about an hour and a half hour 45 to get in some games one night during the week yeah and when you when you travel like how long do you play for do you play for like because you're traveling three hours i mean how, how how long are you playing who are you playing with who are you who do you who do you go find if I go down to Charleston, I usually play with Anderson Scarpa, Greg Dow, Casey Diamond, and Olivia McMillan, and Garrett Singletary. And those I usually stay for like a Friday night and then Saturday and Sunday morning. And we'll play for two to three hours Friday and then do a drill session and maybe a play session on Saturday and then another two to three hour session Sunday. Yeah. And then when I go up to Charlotte for nights, it's usually Eddie Perez and Wynn Johnson. And those are usually three to five hours of playing. Yeah. Just getting solid games. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of, I, I mean, obviously, it, it looks like you're working on technique or adding shots as well. I mean, how, do you have a coach that you work with? So I have, there is one coach that I've done a little bit of work with in the last few months that lives out in Washington. And his name is Travis. He coaches some of the players up in Oregon, like Eric Lang and Spencer Lanier. And so I've done a little bit with him and have frequent calls with them about tournaments and how I should be training, which has helped a lot. Yeah. What's, what are some of the tips you've, you've gotten specifically around training and setting yourself up for success? Mainly stuff at the kitchen line, like kind of focus. Like if you drill an hour and a half, then I would spend like an hour at the kitchen line and focus on reaching in and pushing the balls wide and trying to set yourself up and then if you don't end the point on the first ball or the first speed up then maybe speed up the ball hit your one shot 
to get set up for the three or the five. And so that's kind of been the biggest things I've been working on. Okay. Very cool. Awesome. Um, and you know, what, what are your goals with pickleball? So my goals for this year are to win an APP tournament and get on the map, get on the top 10 with that. And then hopefully continue to play international tournaments and kind of build a name for myself with those and hopefully win an APP next gen as well. Yeah. I mean, um, you said there isn't as many players in your region. Um, what, what do you think your strategy to take whatever you're doing to the next level? I think that after I graduate from high school, I'll probably move down to Florida or Texas where there's a good majority of top pros that I can train with each day. And then from there, find some off-court training and either do schooling online or go to a college there in person. Nice, for sure. So I see you wearing a, a, a Gamma a shirt. Um, what does that collaboration look like? So I've been with Gamma for a little over two years now, and I started on the junior developmental team back when I was 15, and now I'm on a full pro contract with them. And they've been very great, great paddles, great gear, yeah. and very supportive through my pickleball career. Yeah. So when, you, when you're a junior, because I know, you know, a, a lot of people are getting into it. And I think, you know, starting young is a very good thing. Um, what did that support look like when you were a junior? I mean, an entry freeze, coaching, access, like how did it look like for you as a, you know, as a 15 year old? So then it was mainly just like uh, support and some paddles and gears here and there, and then some team dinners where I got to sit and meet some of the better players that they have and kind of talk with them and get a little bit of coaching. And how do they evolve? So what, what does it look like now? What's, what, what's, what's the support from a you know, brand like that right now? So they, uh, it's a little more financial than what it used to be. They definitely do some tournaments here and there and still get paddles and lead tape and anything that comes out and then some equipment for drilling as well to kind of get, if I want to teach to get that started. Okay. Very cool. Um, and when you look at, look for a partner, I mean, what's, what sort of um, partners or playing styles or whatnot um, do you prefer, or, you know, you, you found work really well for you as a partnership? I found that players that are aggressive, but can take the backseat role and play the setter upper as well are really good for me. And I tend to look for partners, especially nowadays that have some points so that we can get into the main draw. And then with a partner that's, solid and we can who's ever playing better can kind of be the alpha player at the time and i can always take a step back and just set up yeah and how do you how do you how do you determine that is it a prior conversation do you go drill together and play together uh if you know um how, how do you approach that conversation to say who does what usually it's a just a conversation before the match or if it's a first time partnership then during the warm up and then during the match, you just have to be straight up with your partner. And if you're not playing well, then I would say, hey, like, I'm not playing my best right now. Do you mind taking a little more court? And I'll just set you up. And so it's just having transparency with your partner and being able to tell them straight up kind of what's happening at the time. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Or or maybe you notice something on the other side that maybe your partner can get at easier. Yes, yes. Then definitely let them know. I've had a lot of people that I ask for tips like that and which has really helped a lot. That's awesome. Um what advice do you have for, you know, 
younger people starting, I mean, you're young, but even, even younger people that are starting pickleball, uh, what, what sort of advice would you give them on their first couple of steps? I would say as much fun as it is to play, that drilling is definitely a lot more important when you're first starting out and you just need the reps and you need to develop the shots. So that way, when you go into the games, they can be really competitive and high level. And then to start playing some tournaments when you can, just to see kind of different players outside of your area and get in some good pickup games with better players. And then try to surround yourself with just a good crowd and atmosphere that you can have fun with while always also focusing on the task at hand. Awesome. Great advice. I love it. Is there anything I didn't ask you, but you wanted to share? Another thing is I would say off court training is very important. I've been working with a guy named Brian that has a company called Myo move, which is like an injury prevention and physical therapy. And then, uh, on court performance. And so they kind of build a pickleball specific workout, which has been very good. And I've seen some great results with it. A lot of faster speed, getting the balls quicker and things like that. So I would say definitely start some off court training as early as you can. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. You have a bright future and I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Alpha Pickleball Podcast with Tats. If you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe, rate, and connect with us on social media. Stay alpha on the pickleball court until our next session.